let's move on and let's uh, let's start. Well, I would say the juicy part, um, actually. Um, um, you see, you see that uh, my um, preview here, as regards the frame visualization, looks like a smooth coloring of these beams and columns. But this is because I, well, not always, but normally I uh, keep the mesh edges invisible in my in my uh, grasshopper preview. Uh, this is something that you, that you can switch on and off with. Uh, while you're inside a uh, grasshopper, you can hit Control M, like mesh, and you see that uh, the uh, mesh edges are turned on and off. Okay, so this is actually what you should what you should see uh, if you run this kind of simulation, because normally mesh edges are visible in grasshopper. Uh, so Control M allows to switch the mesh edges on and off. Um, so this is actually the real preview of uh, uh, Milipi. Um, uh, this, you see the amount of faces that you see here is basically related to the details, uh, the detailing of the result that you want to display in your, in your simulation. Um, uh, this is something that um, actually affects several things, but in this case, uh, you see that, that there is this subdivision parameter here. Um, this is actually affecting the amount of edges that you see along the beams and columns, okay? Now, this is something that uh, actually doesn't affect the simulation too much because um, the, the thing that affect millipede simulation are those things that affect the simulation, the solver, okay? But this resolution of the mesh somehow happens after the simulation has run. So this is something that might affect the preview of your system, but not the calculation. So in this case, this subdivision affects the resolution of the elements, but only after the simulation. There is another, um, uh, let's say, workflow that always uh, includes millipede usage, where the simulation becomes very important for defining the resolution of the FBA system. So something that affects the simulation. Okay? In that case, we will be uh, careful of uh, tweaking this parameter because that can be, uh, let's say, way more time consuming than in this case. So Rob, I have a question. Should we worry about the overlap between beams and columns? Uh, well, uh, it depends. Uh, it depends. Actually, you see that um, the joints in this case are not taken into account. Uh, basically, the joints are, are taken into account in millipedes like um, um, supports. Remember that we define the supports as, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, rotational supports somehow. They avoid rotations, but they allow translations. Um, but in terms of, of, of the geometry of the joints, uh, they are not taken into account. Uh, the thing is that I, it's a little, let's say, an abstract representation, but all the elements end up in the intersection point, which is something that uh, it's evident it cannot happen normally, right? Um, so as from uh, the construction point of view, uh, this is not taking into account several things. Uh, uh, that's why I told you that uh, Millipede is somehow um, a plugin that can give you quite a realistic a simulation of the behavior of your structure, but I would not I would not rely on this for very detailed uh, simulation. This is not um, substituting a structural analysis system. You know, like, like there are many of them, but anyway, um, this is this is, this is, cannot substitute that kind of software. Okay, but um, uh, this kind of tools is useful uh, if you are into a parametric uh, modeling process. So if you work inside Grasshopper, you might want to already have an idea of how your structure will going to perform. And then you are going to analyze this uh, in a, um, a structural analysis system like robot or whatever you might want to use. Um, actually, in that case, for example, you might want to use some uh, X export plugin. Uh, like in this case, I'm using the, the Geometry Gene plugin, which is a very powerful uh, tool. And the export uh, creates IFC uh, files. Um, you can add as many details as you want to these IFC files, and you can export your structure inside any um, structural analysis software where you can perform a very detailed uh, analysis. Okay, but Millipede is just to have a a 
well, more or less quick idea of how your structure will behave. Okay, so I hope this uh, answers your, your question. Um, so let's jump into the optimization uh, workflow. And it's going to be uh, very easy um, because everything is uh, basically taken into account by Goldfish. Um, we can also use Opossum if you want. You see that they are uh, basically the same. Um, maybe it's more clear because here uh, the inputs are called variables and objectives. Um, here you have uh, parameters and objectives. Okay, um, but it works exactly. The, they work exactly the same. Uh, Goldfish has another um, input uh, which we are not going uh, uh, to use um, in this uh, in this course. Um, but this is actually um, um, something that uh, has to deal with, uh, you, you know, this simulation, for example, when we ran the simulation with uh, Galapagos, you see that Galapagos um, performs like, like a brute force attack to the structure, okay? So uh, there are many, many different solutions um, which can be feasible or not, okay? In that case, the only uh, thing that you can do is rely on your, let's say, experience, okay? And determine whether a solution is feasible or not. In this case, you can uh, connect or you can plug this. Remember that um, these uh, optimization components, uh, you don't plug things to them, you plug them to things. In this case, you can plug the C to constraints, which are Boolean components, and they affect the feasibility of your, of your solution. So you can all also take into account if one of, or, or, or in general, the solutions that the software is calculating are feasible or not. And so exclude, exclude them from your optimization process. But we're not going to do this um, because our simulation is a very simple simulation. So uh, we have no criteria for determining this at this moment, at this stage. Um, of course, the, the interface of Opossum and Goldfish is going to be different. I like the Goldfish interface uh, uh, way more than the Opossum interface, even if, if you want to go into details, Opossum is somehow technically more advanced than, gold, than Goldfish. So if you uh, are willing to consider um, these optimization uh, processes uh, like in a professional way, I would go deeper uh, and analyze both of them and understand if you want to um, uh, rely or concentrate on Opossum or Goldfish. Um, it has to deal with the optimization um, algorithm that they use. Opossum has a wider range of, of algorithms that you can select from. Um, and, uh, and yes, maybe it's, uh, it, it's more powerful than Goldfish, but for our purposes, Goldfish is more than enough, okay? So I will concentrate on, on Goldfish. And like with Galapagos, okay? So in terms of, if you want to create an analogy between the two, the genome are the parameters, and fitness are the objectives, okay? Now, the difference, the main difference is that fitness can be can only be one single value, while uh, the uh, optimization objectives can be how many values you wish to take into account for the optimization process. Now, what are our parameters? What are the parameters that are affecting the behavior of this structure? Well, in our case, are the width and height of the cross sections. Okay, only these parameters here. Um, of course, if I was using a I section for metal beams, for example, I would also have thickness as a parameter. The two thicknesses actually of the body and of the wings of, uh, of the beam, of the cross section, okay? So in that case, I would have more than two gene pools connected to the uh, parameters or from the parameters, okay? So when you want to define uh, uh, the parameters, um, let's do this from scratch. I'm going to delete Goldfish. You just grab Goldfish, place it inside your canvas, and drag wires from uh, the P uh, of your uh, Goldfish to the gene pool. And you see, you don't have to, uh, let's say, like a sniper, you don't have to uh, take exactly the output of the gene pool. You just over with a mouse, uh, over the gene pool, and then the uh, wire anchors to the gene pool itself. And you have this pinkish um, 
grouping happening for this uh, component. Um, and as for uh, common connection in Grasshopper, if you want to add another uh, parameter, you shift, drag another cable, another wire, and plug it to the other gene pool. And so they are connected to uh, the um, goldfish as parameters. Okay? And the objectives. Now, the, as, the, as for the objective, the max deflection is actually sent to a number container, and this number container has the proper name. So I do recommend that you do this because inside the interface of Goldfish, you will find this name here in order to identify the values that you are optimizing. So this is max deflection, and this is weight of, uh, of the whole uh, structure. And these are the objectives that I want to optimize. So I want to, um, let's say, change the width and height of the cross sections of both columns and beams in order to optimize the structure in terms of um, efficiency, actually, because if you have a more efficient structure, it means that the deflection is going to be uh, reduced. But also I want to optimize the weight of this structure. Um, so at the same time, I will try to find the best, the best solution that allows to optimize both maximum deflection and weight. So as, the, as for the objective, I'm going to drag a wire that leads to the maximum deflection, shift, drag another wire to the weight of the structure. And so that's it, basically. Uh, if you want to um, uh, dynamically see what happens with these values during the, the optimization process, you can take a panel here. Uh, this is going to be max deflection. I'm getting rid of, uh, rid of path and indices as well. And I'm going to plug the weight to another panel and name this weight structure. Uh, this is because um, if you don't do this, um, you, you don't have an idea of how these values are changing during the, the optimization process. Okay? Um, now, I'm also going to um, leave these aside like this and double click on the icon of goldfish so this is uh, the interface goldfish interface um you see that um well let's let's uh, at first uh expand this uh this window here um there are some options and the um, optimization running here on the left these are the objectives if you select many objectives you can decide if you want to optimize, for example, in our case, we only have two objectives, so you can you, we can optimize also uh, only maximum deflection versus weight. Okay, and this is where you see the optimization in in, in progress. Okay, we will see this in a while. Uh, first of all, the options. Um, I would suggest that you don't change this unless you have very specific uh, needs. Okay, and uh, this is basically uh, defining how much time or how much iterations your optimization process will take before stopping. Now, the optimization process, hypothetically speaking, could, could, could be endless, right? Um, so it's good for us to stop it at a certain point. Normally, with this uh, number of iterations uh, and population size, um, uh, I normally have found out that uh, it's uh, most likely that the user stops the, the optimization process before it reaches this amount of iterations. Okay? So 100 iteration, iterations are, are already uh, uh, lots of iterations. Okay? Uh, and also remember that for each iteration, the solver is going to create 100 population, which means that each iteration will, will take into account 100 variations of your structure. Okay? So that's, that's the meaning of iteration and population size. And let's say during the first iteration, the solver will, will change the, the um, cross-section of the structure 100 times. So 100 different combinations of cross-sections for each iteration. And when it uh, steps uh, forward to the second iteration, it will only take into account the best performing solutions inside this population. And starting from that solution, it will create 100 additional variation for the second iteration, and so on. 
So it's a refinement process. Okay. Uh, these are more um, tricky parameters here. Oh, this is a time constraint. So if you want the simulation or the optimization to, to run for a certain time, uh, you can also define um, the uh, you can also stop the, the, uh, the optimization process, not by iterations, but by uh, time. So if you want, uh, if you have one hour and you want to leave the computer one hour calculating the optimization, then you just time constraint and define the one hour limit uh, for the time, okay? Um, this is, normally I do this when I want the computer to run the simulation, I don't know, when I am at lunch, for example. Um, so in that case, I let the optimization process run for a longer time span so i can come up with a very um, precise solution okay uh, these are these are like tricky parameters here um, they affect um, the the selection of the um, cases that must be transferred to the next iterations basically okay so um, normally this is something that uh, unless you have very specific uh, needs, I will not tweak this parameter here because uh, the risk is that you compromise the result of the simulation. So normally, if you leave them like this, you have a standard uh, optimization process and normally you get to the, to the desired result. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically, we can jump to the optimization uh, panel here. And in this case, I will uh, decrease the size of this uh, window just so that we can uh, have a look at the structure here, at least partially, and all the button here that we have in our interface. Uh, this column here is uh, basically like unnecessary, uh, actually, unless you have uh, multi-objectives, like instead of two, like plenty of. Uh, so you can select which kind of optimization you want to run. But in our case, we only have maximum deflection and weight. They are. Maximum deflection is, the, is on the horizontal axis and weight is in the vertical axis. So these are actually kilograms and these are actually, they should be actually, I don't know, maybe they are centimeters. We will, um, no, they are meters actually. So we will uh, see this uh, while the simulation is going on. So uh, you see that number of parameters and number of objectives are, they are uh, reported here. Uh, you can, if this is something like, um, uh, automatic uh, unconditioned uh, behavior. I always reset post start. Okay, so you see that when you start, uh, this is a evaluating particle. These are the population size. You see, so it's uh, increasing up to 100 during the first iteration. When it reaches 100, it takes the best performing uh, particles or population and leave and bring them to the second iteration. What's happening here is that the structure is changing. Um, the the cross-section is changing per element. So you see that columns are getting thicker and thinner at the various height and also the beams, okay? Of course, in this case, Millipede is capable of, of uh, uh, calculating this in real time, but if you have more complex systems, then this, is, this would not happen in real time. So each change of the uh, evaluated particle will take seconds to update the system. So this thing here can become very, very slow, okay? In our case, it's happening more or less in real time. So you see how this thing is uh, uh, slowly, but consistently uh, going towards a, a, a solution. Now, this is not so evident if you leave things like this, but if you hit the history button here, you will have all the iteration one after the other, um, visualized in this uh, graph here. So you see that each iteration will add dots inside this graph. These dots, as we are optimizing the, both the weight and max deflection, tends to be dispersed inside this area, tends towards the lower left corner. So if things are set up properly, you will have the best performance uh, concentrated in the lower left corner. So you see that we are already uh, decreasing this. Remember that in, in the original scale, we have 20, 40, 60, 80. These were meters. Now we have 0 0.00032 meters. Okay, so the deformation is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This is the maximum deflection. And also the weight of the structure is actually decreasing. We already reached 600,000 uh, kilos for our structure. Okay, 
And if you leave this running, eventually these values could also decrease more and more. Um, we already have eight iterations. You see, in this case, it's quite fast. So you can also leave this uh, like running. And in the meanwhile, um, you can also see if this, uh, um, let's say, optimization process is, lead, is leading to an in interesting result. Um, I am going to uh, pause this. The, the, the interesting thing of this uh, uh, solver here is that you can pause it. And as long as you don't reset it, it's going to store all the results inside the component. Okay. So I can pause this, I can close this, I can go inside here, and as soon as, as long as I don't change anything of the parameters, of course, I, I can change the parameter manually. In this case, I would affect the actual optimization process. Okay, but if I don't do this, and I reopen uh, the Goldfish interface, I will have the same iteration number and and particle evaluation. Uh, they are still visible and still stored inside the component okay so as long as you don't hit the reset button inside this uh, optimization uh, um, component here you will always have the results here what can we do with these results um, lacking galapagos lacking any uh, solver uh, well actually in opossum is not like this so in this uh, sense um, the goldfish is maybe more more user friendly in, in, in this sense. So um, if you want to optimize both deflection and weight, so you want a light structure, but a performance structure, maybe you want to take into account the dots that appear more or less in the left uh, in the lower left corner. So the lighter structure corresponds to this dot here, which is, on the other hand, uh, um, let's say uh, determining the higher deformation one of the higher deformation in your structure this is the higher deformation you see this one so if you left click inside this uh, um, area here and you left click and drag the mouse as soon as you go close to one of the dots you see the the values that corresponds to that particular solution so in this case max deflection is uh, 0 0.3 millimeters, so very, very small, but the weight starts to be higher, like 800,000 kilos. So if you want to decrease this, you must go lower here. And here we have a maximum deflection of, uh, once again, uh, 0 0.3 millimeters, but the structure is 200,000 kilos lighter than the previous solution, okay? If you want, um, let's say the lighter version of your structure, you must take into account this dot here. So the lighter version is less than 600,000 kilos, but you have 0 0.4 millimeters deformation, which is nothing. So in this case, uh, th this is where the, the user uh, gets in and takes decisions. So for me, there is absolutely no difference between this def deflection here and this deflection. Remember that this is the maximum deflection. So this structure is completely deformed with respect to the ideal system, but the maximum deformation happens with correspondence to the max deflection value, which is between 0 0.000032 meters and 0 0.00046 meters. So nothing and nothing. So the only um, feature that I'm interested in in this case is taking the lighter structure. So for me, there is no different or no reason for considering, for example, this dot here, which is the smallest possible deformation, at least according to 10 iterations. Okay? If we let this run again over and over, eventually, after several um, iterations, there will also be a lighter structure and less deformation. But in this case, um, according to these results, for me, there is no need to, um, to select this value, for example, because between 0 0.00032 and this value here, there is absolutely no difference. So you select the value that you, uh, the dot that you want, you right click on it and you reinstate it. And so uh, what's happening is that in your definition, the gene pools are actually changing to the set of, of uh, 
width and height for the cross section that are determining this kind of result here. Okay. Um, you can also uh, export these uh, these values here uh, as a CSV file. Um, I'm going to export them like uh, 0710, which is today. Um, and I'm going to export them like a simple frame building 001. Okay, here they are. And I guess that if we go here, we have our CSV file. Let's open it. Let's see how it looks. This is interesting because uh, you have already a spreadsheet with all the information about your, uh, your structure. Of course, it's a CSV, so you must um, uh, you must uh, manipulate somehow this, uh, these uh, values because they are contained only in, in one single cell. So you see that they are sorted like this. And you have gene pool, a uh, gene pool, which are the two uh, parameters. Uh, actually, um, I, I think it would be smarter. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do this. It could be smarter also to uh, take this and name it. Uh, what is this? This is actually, it should be actually the width. Yeah. So this is uh, cross section uh, width. And this is going to be cross section uh, height. And so this means that um, once we have these results here, uh, and we export them. Uh, uh, maybe. Oh, I, I think I was exporting only this uh, uh, this dot here. So you must select the the dots that you want to that you want to export. So this is actually taking the best solution or the solution that you are taking into account, not all of them. So in this case, for example, I say that I am interested in the lighter structure, which is going to be this one, and then you export it, and it's going. To, well, let's uh, overwrite this. Uh, this file. Let's go back into our CSV and we should now have a clearer understanding of uh, what we have. Yeah, it's width and height and then there is max deflection and weight. Okay, so you see that everything is uh, usable in uh, outside from, from Grasshopper also for different processes, also more analytical or, or uh, more construction uh, like processes. Um, in any moment, you can. If you did not hit the reset button, you can always press start again, and it will resume the calculation from where it stopped. So you see that it didn't reset actually. It is completing the tenth iteration, and it's switching to the eleventh iteration. And if things are set up properly, you will have these uh, dots concentrating towards the, the lower left corner. Uh, you can also export this uh, diagram here. You simply right click on this in this area. And you can do whatever you want, basically. Um, if you want to export a complex set of, of data, you can also select all, uh, and then you export the desired results. Um, I do recommend that you do this operation when the uh, simulation has stopped, um, so you don't run into uh, problems. Um, so you see that we are actually reaching um, lighter structure. It, it seems nothing, but we already have a structure which is lighter by a factor of 10,000 kilos. Okay, it's this one. Now we have a structure that's lighter by a factor of um, almost 20,000 kilos with respect to the previous solution, which was this one. Okay, so you see that if you leave this running and running, you get a, a more optimized structure. And you see that initially, um, it, it's also interesting to, to observe that initially, um, the red areas, which is the maximum, well, actually, this is representing the deflection of the elements. Okay, remember, it depends on, on uh, what uh, option you set here in the frame visualization uh, component. Um, but initially, you saw that these red area were, were moving around all over the structure, but now they tend to remain in the same position. This is because uh, the, the solver is actually um, considering only the best solution. Okay, no, no, it's not uh, shuffling again from scratch each uh, iteration. Okay, 
So, so um, it's, a, it's a progressive refinement uh, operation. The longer you leave this running, the best result you will get. Uh, so let's see, uh, I think we can stop this right now. We already got to more than 20,000 uh, kilos less than the previous solution. And it's, it's, it's still decreasing, you see? Five, six, eight, and it's going to decrease more and more and more eventually. Um, so yeah, basically let's pause this. Uh, let's reinstate the, the lighter structure. So reinstate this and eventually you will have, well, actually, I, I think uh, if we should also uh, leave this running uh, a little more eventually, because if you remember uh, my solution or the initial solution, it was something that was perfectly, let's say, uh, uh, understandable. Uh, we had the thicker columns at the bottom, the thinner column at the top. But in this case, at this intermediate, um, uh, iteration uh, level, you see that this column is thicker than this one, uh, which is something that probably is, is not so correct, right? So uh, eventually we should uh, leave this goldfish running a little more in order to come up with the, a, the proper solution. But uh, you can also, um, let's say, um, determine some kind of, uh, uh, of uh, um, trigger in order to understand, uh, as I was telling you, we're not going to implement this because it's somehow uh, tricky to do this, but uh, you can uh, come up with a Boolean value that, for example, analyzes the, the structure and uh, eventually you can say, you can create some condition here that says that if the um, column that lie at the upper story is uh, thicker than uh, the lower story, this can uh, produce like a true value and you can use that that true false value in order to understand if the solution is feasible or not so that's the the idea behind these constraints okay you, you just must implement some um, workflow here that analyzes the solution and come up with some true false values that can be used as constraint inside the goldfish component but in general, if, uh, if you leave this uh, just like running and running, it will automatically uh, come up with uh, some nice results as the previous one that uh, was in the original uh, definition. So, um, any doubts, any questions uh, about uh, this, uh, this solver? Do you like to ask something or and something. Uh, yeah, me and Carlo. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, about the solver, I think everything's clear, but uh, I have a doubt about uh, the system uh, configuration, about the yeah. uh, gym pools, where yeah. you are plugging them. Um, where am I plugging them? Well, I'd like to review the, this, this part. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, well, I'm getting rid of. Uh, uh, well, actually, if, if you want, you know what? Uh, let me let me do uh, this. Okay. So, um, as we already have built uh, another structure, which was this one, let's try to implement uh, the same um, optimization process inside this uh, simpler uh, structure here. Okay. So let's define uh, also in this case. Um, a variable thickness, a variable width, a variable height for all of these beams, okay? Um, so, um, I guess, yeah, these are, these are the columns. So let me just place a scribble here so I can quickly identify the columns, uh, which are this one. And also let me place this here. So we have the beams. We can recognize them immediately. Perfect. Okay, so um, you see that um, uh, in this case, we must uh, make the change that I was uh, telling you. We have uh, um, the cross section, uh, which is uh, uh, actually defined by a slider. So it's already available, but it's one cross section for all the columns. And it's one single cross section for all the beams. Okay, so this is meeting just one cross section at a time. 
now we need to differentiate the cross section by element okay so in this case what we will do is the same we must graft the output of the cross section and then feed the cross section input with this grafted uh, structure here and now we must define several different cross sections one cross section per column so we need four uh, cross sections okay and the cross section must be variable for each column so the material is going to, to remain the same i'm not going to work with the material i will leave steel okay but i want the column to have the same width and height so a and b are still going to be the same value Okay, but in this case, I need four different values, one for each column. So in this case, I use a gene pool. And this gene pool is going to be column width and height, because it's one value affecting both parameters. Okay, and then I go inside here and say I need four slider. Um, I can use decimal or not. It depends on how uh, precise you want to, to be. In this case, I'm forced to use decimals because unless I want to work with uh, column width and height uh, of at least one meter, if I don't use uh, decimal numbers, I can only have uh, columns that measure one by one meter, two by two meters, and so on, okay? which is uh, a little exaggerated, of, of course. So I'm using two decimal numbers, which are basically uh, being as precise as one centimeter. Okay, so that's how you define the number of decimal and the range. What is the smallest column that you want uh, to consider in your simulation? This is, uh, once again, this is something that uh, it's, it's the designer that, that, that uh, takes this, uh, this decision, right? Uh, you can, for example, say uh, you want the smallest section to be one centimeter by one centimeter. You already know that this is not going to work, right? But this is a computer. You, you can also uh, tell him to, to consider this kind of range. Um, this uh, will eventually be, uh, let's say, um, not taken into account after the first iteration because it, it's going to produce some very, very um, dramatic deformation in your system. And as maximum deflection is going to be one of our parameters for determining the best performing uh, solution, this is going to be, uh, let's say, uh, not taken into account after the first iteration, for sure. But this is an error. Like maximum 100 meters, this is an error from, from ourselves, from, our, from the designer. Because um, the computer is not capable of, of detecting uh, collisions, right, or clashing. Uh, this is not Revit, for example, you, you, or, or Navisworks. You, you cannot detect clashes in your system. So it, uh, hypothetically speaking, it can consider uh, columns 100 meters by 100 meters. So this is up to us. We must define the proper range for these uh, sliders. And so maybe I would say that 0 0.20 as the, the smallest cross section for our column uh, up to one meter eventually is enough. And so we have defined this uh, gene pool. How do we use this? Well, actually this is going to define the uh, side of our beams, uh, sorry, columns, and also the width of our um, beams. Okay, so this is going to affect three aspects of our structure: the cross section of the uh, of the column totally, and the width of the beams in order for them to have the same width as the column. So if we see them from top. You see that the width of the beam is actually corresponding to the, the width height of uh, the uh, the column. Okay, um, and so this graph here. Uh, also, we, we can also uh, create another. Uh, well, actually, we can get rid of this ladder, which is not no longer connected to to uh, parameters, and we can also take into account the um, thickness of the body and of the wings of this uh, cross section. Now, even in this case, we can use. Um, um, uh, a gene pool for T1, another gene pool for T2, if you want a very detailed uh, simulation, okay? So you can also, um, uh, let's say, base your uh, decisions uh, by changing the amount of T1 and T2 independently, okay? But in order to 
simplify a little the process, uh, we can also take another gene pool. Um, we are going to name this like, uh, what was the name of this one? Column with height. And this is going to be column thickness. Okay. And in, instead, in this case, uh, we are going to consider the thickness of the uh, body and, and wings at the same time. Um, we must use uh, decimals. In this case, uh, this, um, these values here uh, could also get to a detail of a millimeter. So eventually, if you want, you, you must always set four as the number of thicknesses that you must uh, specify, but you can also increase this to three in order to consider a thickness ranging between, I don't know, uh, 0 0.5 centimeter, which is a nonsense for our system because this this system is huge you know so the span is actually 18 meters like 20 by by 15 so this kind of thickness is probably not going to work never okay uh, but anyway in order to to uh, to have a better understanding of how you make this decision uh, this could be um, 0 0.5 centimeter as the lower value and uh, remember that um, the thickness um, must be consistent with the general width and height of the cross-section. So if the smallest cross-section has 20 uh, centimeters, you cannot come up with a thickness of, I don't know, uh, 20 maybe, because you are going to, uh, let's say, um, uh, create a, a, a some inconsistent relation between the thickness of the body and or the wings and the global dimension of, of the cross section. So in this case, eventually, I would say that five centimeter is uh, is more than enough. Okay. If you want to avoid considering um, like uh, some ridiculous values like this one, then I would suggest you start some from something like at least two or three centimeters um, or more. Okay. But anyway, this is going to be our uh, gene pool, both for T1 and T2. And as the beams and the columns have different behaviors, I will not use this as the thickness for the, uh, the beams. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the width is already de determined by this gene pool here. I will copy this and name this like uh, beam height and connect it to the B of uh, the cross section for our beam and get rid of this slider. And then we have thickness for uh, the beams. And now I will not connect these the same. I will generate a copy as well and naming this like beam thickness and plug it to T1 and T2. So I am making the thickness of the body and wing of the beams independent from the witness uh, the, the the width the thickness sorry of uh, the um, body and wings of the columns okay uh, so yes that's pretty it so we have our um, gene pools that's how you define them and now let's um, take goldfish and uh, what I want to use as parameters is width and height of the cross-section of the column thickness of body and wings of the columns and the height of the beams and the thickness of body and wings of the cross-section of the beams. So all of these things here are going to be considered as parameters by uh, Goldfish. And what do I want to optimize? Well, it's absolute, absolutely the same. So this is weight. We already gave a name to this. I'm going to take another number container pass the max deflection to this, name this like max deflection. If you don't do this, uh, you won't see uh, this uh, name, this variable, or you won't be able to recognize this variable inside the Goldfish interface. And also eventually have this value visible here so you can, at the, uh, with a, a, a glimpse, you can have an idea of what's happening inside your uh, uh, simulation. So this is the fraction, maximum the fraction. So what I want to optimize is the weight, 
shift the maximum deflection. And so once again, everything is uh, set. Uh, of course, we will have more detailed variation in this case because what is going to change is also the thickness of the body and wings of both columns and, uh, and beams. So I'm going to zoom in a little more in order to see this in action. And I'm going to double click here. I'm not going uh, through the details this time. I'm just going to run this, but I want to keep visible both the uh, visual deformation and the numerical result here. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to reset, pause, and start. You see that everything is changing here uh, with height, thickness, and also the um, resulting deformation that you get from, from this system, as you can see. Um, remember, after one iteration, um, it, it makes no sense to do this uh, before the first iteration is completed. You hit history button. So when the second iteration completes, you will have the overlapping of the progressive results that you get from this uh, simulation. Oh, you see, this, this, uh, there, there is an error uh, in, uh, in this uh, definition. And you can see this because you have, uh, if, if you look at here, you see um, several beams appear at the same time. Okay, so this is an error. This is not going to work. Um, and the problem is that when you use several parameters here, you must graph to the cross section. We did it for the columns, but eventually we, we didn't do this for the cross section of the beams, you see? So the beams are, are being generated like, you see four sets of four beams at the same time. This is not correct because we only have four beams here. So it's not 16 beams. We only need four beams. And this is happening because we didn't graph the cross section. Okay, so why you didn't tell me? <laughs> okay, so um, we graph this and use the grafted cross section as the cross section. So now we have one cross section per beam. And so here we have four uh, separate branches, each one containing one beam. Now this is, this is correct. Okay, so we go back inside uh, Goldfish. And let me also visualize this uh, area. Also eventually to have the history button visible. Reset, all star. And now we see only one beam at a time. I'm not going to uh, leave this thing running uh, too much, uh, but just in order to have an idea of how this uh, refinement process works. I'm going to leave this for, well, let's say five iterations, maybe. It's going to be enough. If you are running some studies, uh, eventually you don't want this uh, solver to reach the 100 iterations, okay? This is, you only do this if you want to come up with some, uh, let's say, realistic result. But if you want to analyze the behavior of your structure, already after a few number of iterations, you already have an idea on, of, of where your system is going, uh, like in terms of, of uh, efficiency. So you see that the values are already concentrating here in the lower left corner. Just pay attention. It depends on um, in which order you plug the objective uh, wires from, uh, from Goldfish to the, uh, the objectives. In this order affect the uh, horizontal and vertical axis, as you can see. Now we have maximum deflection on the left and weight on the bottom, on the horizontal axis. So just pay attention to these, no rocket science, but uh, in order to clearly understand what's happening in your optimization process, we have a lighter structure to the left and the lower deformation to the bottom. So we already have these uh, very, very small values. They are uh, lower than, than the previous simulation. You see, this is 0.1 millimeter. We are getting to basically undeformed structure here. So once again, there is no difference between this value here or no reason to, to choose a uh, uh, heavier structure in order to decrease the deformation when you have this range of deformations here. It's ridiculous. This is something that uh, has to do with the interpretation of, of, of these uh, processes. 
this is something that only the designer or the architect or the engineer can, can do. And so maybe uh, if I prefer to have a lighter structure, I would go for this solution here, which is 5.45 multiplied by 10 at the minus 0 0.5. So it's a very, very small value. And another one popped up here, which is still uh, even lighter because it lies more on the left. So it's uh, 86,000 uh, kilos. And also a new one. This one, 83.5 thousand kilos. So you see that this refinement process already with 10 iterations. I mean, probably there is no need to to go on and on because uh, this is uh, basically uh, useless. But let's see what happens if we go with uh, a, an extremely light uh, structure. In this case, I'm going to take this solution, reinstate it, and you see that we have some. Uh, uh, consideration to, to do. You see that even if uh, the maximum deflection was, uh, let's say, very, very small, extremely small, 10 at the power of minus 5, it, it, it means 0 0.0000 and whatever, you know, so nothing. Yet we see this kind of huge deformation. Remember, this is not real. This is amplified by this division here. Even if you have a very small value here, as the deflection is very small, divided by this value of the maximum deflection, this is producing a huge value, you see? So we are amplifying the deflection too much. So when you perform this kind of analysis, don't rely on the visual preview unless you have this set to zero. Now you can clearly understand that deformation is basically non-existent. The only thing that you see here is the red. And uh, also, in this case, give this red the proper meaning. Okay, This is not something you have to worry about. This is just the way that the deflection visualization, uh, uh, let's say, is, is coloring the maximum deflection, but this is the value. Okay, So there is no need to worry about this red color here. And also, you can switch to to other uh, to to other um, uh, uh, properties of this uh, structure if you want to have a visual representation of uh, such properties. But yeah, is it is it clear right now? Okay. Uh, yes, of course. Is everything clear? And this is really amazing. Yes, I think this is pretty useful. Um, um, I, I repeat, this is not something that I would uh, rely on as a, a structural analysis, but this gives you quite a clear idea of uh, how your structure is going to behave. Um, and what we are optimizing here, of course, is, is not the distribution of, of elements, but we are optimizing the, um, the, the um, properties, the geometrical properties of the elements. Okay? So we are only... Um, uh, working with width, height, and thickness of beams and columns. Okay, so the structure is not going to be the, the shape of the structure is not going to be affected at a global uh, level, but the single element, yes. Um, of course, we, we can also um, do something a little, uh, let's say, more interesting, uh, actually. So. Um, for example, let's see if we can come up with uh, uh, something uh, uh, something interesting in this sense. Uh, if I take inside millipede, I told you that there are some, let, let's call these like analytical outputs maybe. Um, so where you can, uh, um, um, extrapolate numerical values for, for stresses and, and forces involved and, and so on. Okay. Um, maybe the, the main outputs here are the frame results and also the node results. Okay. Um, this is interesting because, um, well, the first one, of course, gives you an idea of the distribution of stress along the body of the elements. Okay. 
the second one gives you the, the, an idea of how the, the joints behave during the simulation. So you see location, displacement, and rotation of the joints, which is something that eventually is, is, is quite interesting to, to observe. Um, if uh, you want, of course, instead of uh, uh, trying to optimize these objectives here, which are somehow global objectives, right? They, they refer to uh, the global structure because it's maximum deflection, which is even if it happens only in one point, we are uh, taking into account the maximum deflection, which is the maximum deformation of the whole structure, not of one single element, okay? Um, as well as the weight. This is the, 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 the weight of the whole structure, okay? So all the elements together. Um, but we can also base our uh, optimization process on more analytical values. Like for example, I want to reduce the, I don't know, force at the start point, you know? Um, so this is something that changes the perspective. Uh, and in that case, you might um, be able, for example, to create some geometrical variation of the system. So for example, um, Let's do. Let, let's let's tweak this structure. I don't know if, if it's better to tweak this structure or create a new one. Uh, maybe uh, let, let's start creating a new one and then eventually uh, integrate uh, the new one with this one. Okay. So just in order to keep the workflow uh, clearer. So uh, I'm going to leave this uh, aside for a while and I'm going to turn everything off. And what I'm going to do right now is uh, a different thing. Um, uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm always going to create um, a frame structure, like for example, a vertical, I would say a vertical line like this and uh, copy it like here. And I'm going to create a beam like here. But what I want to do right now, I want to create another connection element like this and like this, okay? But I don't want to do this manually, of course. I want to do this parametrically here in Grasshopper because I want this to be part of the simulation, okay? So I can rely on these Rhino elements here to create the basic frame structure. So I'm, I'm going to use these two as columns. So let me also, uh, sorry, uh, I think I'm going to um, copy paste these things here and bring them to this area so I can avoid repeating useless steps. So these are going to be the columns and this is going to be one curve, it's going to be the B. Okay. Now, what I want to do, I want to um, evaluate. Um, for, for example, in this case, this is another um, real life um, um, tricky uh, situation. So. If I need to generate this kind of connection beam between the column and the beam, and the horizontal beam, I need to uh, define a variable point here along the column and a variable point in along the first half, half of the beam. Okay. Um, how do I do this? I can use a point on curve, of course. So if I use this, I will have a variable point running along the columns from the start point at the bottom to the end point at the top. Problem is that this is not a, uh, technically this is not a parameter. So this, is can, this cannot be used for variations automatically inside Grasshopper. This is something that you can slide manually, okay? So there is another way, which is evaluate curve. So evaluate curve allows to derive, to, to define a point along a line or a curve according to a parameter. But this parameter is going to be a natural slider. So something between zero and one. The result is absolutely the same, you see? But, uh, well, apart from um, having to reparameterize this curve. So the result is absolutely the same, but the difference is that you can um, connect your optimization solver to this slider. While you cannot do that with a point on curve. And the same way, I'm going to um, evaluate curve the beam. 
So uh, I'm going to evaluate the beam between 0 and 0 0.5 this time because uh, I only need this point to reach eventually half the length of the beam, so the midpoint. Okay. Um, I can also, as I need both connections, I also need the other beam here on the right, I can also create another slider between 0 0.5 and 1 and plug it to the same parameter. So now we have the possibility to move these two sliders independently and come up with variable solution that will define these connections. And now I have two points here and two points here. So I create a line between start point and end point, and I have these connections. So finally, we have the columns, the beam, and these support beams here. I'm going to internalize the columns. I'm going to internalize the beam so I can get rid of these. And I have the parametric system here. Um, OK, so let's start defining the uh, frame system. Uh, so we go here in FE system. We take the, uh, the frame element. Uh, remember that uh, I think I suggest, I, I don't know what's your position on this, but I suggest to keep the frame element separated by, well, functions or, or uh, somehow the behavior that we foresee in this structure. So, I suggest we separate these uh, uh, frame elements by columns, beam, and support beams, right? So I would not use one single frame element, okay? Even if we can differentiate, for example, the um, with gene pools, we can differentiate the uh, thickness and width and, and so on. Uh, I would recommend that you separate the frame element by function. And so uh, this is going to be the frame elements for the columns. In, in this case, eventually, I would um, like clarify things a little in order to avoid uh, misunderstandings. So um, I would say that uh, let's copy paste this column. So in order to keep things uh, clear, I'm going to send the columns to this. And uh, I'm going to use also copy paste this in order to have it here. This is going to be the beams, so I'm sending this to the beams. And uh, I'm going to copy paste this again. And this is going to be the support beams. And so uh, columns, beams, and support beams are these lines here. So everything here can be, uh, let's say, switched off as preview. We, we no longer need this uh, at this stage. And so we can define the uh, uh, frame element, like starting from these uh, three inputs. So columns, once again, endpoints. Um, we have two columns, so we already need to graph this. So graph tree. Uh, this is something that you can do also in an implicit way, uh, like grafting the output of the component. But remember that as um, millipede doesn't show graft flattening at the uh, input or output level, maybe it's better to uh, keep things clear and use uh, explicit graft and flatten components in this case. So connection for the uh, columns. Done. Um, uh, then we need cross-section. So let's take cross-section, let's take the uh, material preset, let's change this to, I don't know, metal once again. Uh, so this is going to be steel by default, so it's perfect. And um, yeah, now we, we need um, a gene pool for the uh, width and the uh, height and thickness of the columns, okay? So let's take a gene pool. How many columns? We have two. So let's grab this, set it to two. We want decimal numbers because we want to go down to centimeter. Uh, so yes, of course. And I would set these to minimum, or let's, 
let's say 0 0.1, let's see what happens, and a maximum of 0 0.3, or maybe 5. Okay, so don't, let's not exaggerate now with, the, with these values. Uh, and this is going to be a column, columns, um, well, actually, we are going to use this as both uh, width and height. So, well, once again, width, height, as we did before. Uh, so this is the first gene pool, and we are going to apply this. We want square column. We are not going to waste time with a rectangular column. Uh, so we are going to plug this both in A and B. And we need also another gene pool with two values for T1 and T2. But in this moment, this is going to range between 0 0.02 maybe. Uh, and 0 0.05. Ah, oh, and this is going to be column uh, thickness. Yeah, okay, that's pretty. Uh, and remember to graft this thing before connecting uh, to the uh, frame element cross section. Um, linear load, I'm just going to grab. Uh, the same linear load that we have here, and also the up vector. Once we are here, let's take all we need in order to avoid uh, unnecessary waste of time. So this is going to be the up vector, and this is going to be the linear load. Remember that if you want to, for example, apply a different linear load to this element and this element, you must create two vectors with uh, the desired uh, load uh, amount and graph them before plugging them to the linear load, okay? Because this linear load is a property of the element right now. And so you must graph it if you want to apply each load to uh, each element. And the unit x vector is defining the orientation of the cross section as we already know. So it's going to be an horizontal um, cross section. So perpendicular to the axis of the column. So that's it for the, uh, the column. Now let's go to the S beams. Now the S beams are, is going to be defined basically like any other frame element. The, the thing is that this S beam will depend on this parameter here. So the height is going to be one per for, for both columns. If you want, you can also um, create uh, two sliders here, plug them here, and instead of having one, uh, one, the same parameter for both columns, you now have one for the first one, you see, and one for the second one. Uh, these four sliders here are going to be used as uh, parameters for the um, Goldfish optimization. Okay, so Goldfish, we're going to, we are going to plug Goldfish to these four sliders and also to this gene pool and the other gene pool. So as regards the, the frame element, we are going to define this, the S beams exactly as columns or beams. There was maybe some question. I heard some. Um, yes. Um, which is the expression inside the linear load in unit C? Oh, yeah. It's, it's just a minus X. Just to invert this, uh, this factor here and have this vector oriented downwards. So it's like to simulate a, a load in real life. Uh, okay. okay, thanks. You're welcome. So, uh, well, actually, as beams, I'm not going, well, I'm getting lazy today, so I'm going to copy paste this. Uh, I try to avoid this. I don't like copy pasting because each time you repeat something, uh, someone understand clearer uh, the, the concept. So, but anyway, th this is going to be uh, repeating the same thing three times. So I'm going to simply to copy paste, and uh, eventually, in this case, I would uh, just uh, avoid creating um, or connecting these gene pools to both A and B because uh, I want the width of this uh, beam to correspond to the width of the column, and so once again. I'm going to use the, the gene pool that defines the width and height of the column, which is square, by the way, and plug it also to the width of this uh, 
uh, as these. And I will leave this uh, for the uh, height of the cross section. And once again, oh, uh, yeah, let's leave the, the rest is going to be exactly like identical. So copy paste this, and I'm going to apply this to the uh, beams themselves. The beam actually is just one. Uh, in this case, for example, even if uh, you uh, graft, graft, and graft, this is not affecting the result because, um, well, actually it is maybe because, oh yeah, of course, we don't need two um, uh, values here for the cross-section, we just need one, okay? Um, so in this case, for example, as we had uh, one gene pool was affecting the thickness, uh, well, the width and height of two columns in this case, two S beams in this case, but now we only have one single upper beam, okay? So uh, in this case, we cannot um, bind the width of this upper beam to both columns at the same time, you know? So in, in this case, we must, uh, let's say, make the width of the beam independent from uh, the uh, width and height of the columns, okay? There is no way for us in this moment to, uh, to um, uh, use both values uh, from the uh, upper gene pool, okay? So in this case, for example, uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would prefer to copy paste this, uh, well, actually not even this one because we only need one parameter. So in this case, the gene pool is absolutely redundant. So I would say, that we need here something ranging between 0 0.20 and 0 0.5. This is going to be the height. This is going to be the width. Uh, sorry, um, this is the width, this is the height. And now the thickness, um, uh, let's use one single value once again for the thickness. But this is going to be just one slider. We don't need uh, gene pools in this case because we only have one B. If we don't do this, there is no way to obtain one single element here as a result, okay? Even if we graph things here, uh, we need one single value for these parameters here because we only have one curve. Okay, so um, eventually this beam will have some uh, heavy load applied, like 100 more or less. Um, and I think this is pretty it for, for this. Um, Yep. So um, let's let's uh, go to to the supports. Uh, in this case, I would not use uh, any additional loads. It's more than enough with what we have inside these frame elements. So let's go and take the uh, FE point support, and let's go and take the support type. Uh, I'm going to create uh, fixed supports at the bottom of this structure. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. Angry. So this is the support type. There is no need to tweak the support type if you need a fixed support because everything is already set to true. You see from the icon here. Uh, the only thing we need are the start point of the columns. We already have them. It's uh, it's these things here. I'm going to plug the start to the point. So these are already uh, fixed uh, support and. We also need to define uh, the proper supports for the joints. Now, uh, let's take this copy paste, move it up, because the upper points here at the joint between the columns and the main beam are the end point of the column, as we already uh, know. And in this case, we want to allow uh, uh, displacement of these uh, of these points, so we are going to free the translations up. So we only have a rotational support. Um, and then there are these things here. Now, in general, if, if you think about this system as a dynamic system, you should define this connection point as translational supports, something like this point can move along the column and this point can move along the beam. You know? But this is not correct because we must analyze a variation of this system, which, which is going to be a rigid system. So this point is not going to move 
um, while this, the structure is working, right? Uh, this point is going to move only to determine what is the more efficient structure, okay? So in terms of, of joint, in terms of support, this is exactly identical to this point here and this point here, okay? So don't get confused about the dynamic um, um, changes that we want to do and the static behavior that we want for our structure, okay? So in terms of support point, these are also rotational uh, supports. So um, where are these four points here? They come out from the uh, evaluates. These are the four points, two are here, two are here. It doesn't matter in which order they are, we must connect all of them together with this one. So shift and connect them to uh, the um, rotational. And that's it. And now the only thing is that eventually, um, it depends on how you obtain these points uh, in your in your definition. Um, it might happen that um, you know even if these are uh, all lists of points, there is no data tree in this uh, in this definition at the moment. You know, but if you take a panel and you plug, for example, the points coming out from this evaluate curve and plug them inside this panel, you see that also a list has its path. Okay, so uh, if you plug also this start to the same input. If the list doesn't have the same path, the points will not merge together inside one single list. You will get a data tree entering this uh, point input. So if you want to be sure that this FE point supports is receiving a list of points, which is not mandatory, you see that it's not saying point as list, it's just saying points, all right? All right? But if you want to be sure, you must double check this or you must put a flatten before uh, plugging all these values inside the point in. Okay, this is just another time, this is just data manipulation, but it can be important. Uh, so I think that's pretty it. We already have all the uh, elements for our uh, FE system. So let's build the model. Uh, so uh, in this case, yes, uh, I would suggest, I would suggest you flatten in an in explicit way, you flatten the input, like plug all these values here inside one flattened tree component. You see, we already have a data tree here, a list here, another list here, and eventually we have, no, this is one single beam, so it's not, not, not going to be a list, it's a, Oh yeah, because we had a graph. So it's one value. Oh no, no, sorry, my bad. This is the last one. So this was the beam. Yeah, this is going to be one single uh, simple wire as you can see. So this flattened tree is mandatory in this case because in this case, we, should, we, we would have a data tree, also a weird data tree because it has uh, a path with some, one single index and then two paths with two indices. So it's like an asymmetrical data tree. It's very complex. So just flatten this thing and plug the result as a single list to the model component. Remember that this asks for um, model components as list, okay? Because else you will have several models um, if you don't flatten the input. And you will perform analysis on several different models, okay? So you will not be uh, mixing the behavior of one beam with the columns and so on. And so we, Take the solver, plug this here. This is going to give us some uh, results in terms of, well, once again, a lazy person. Let, let's uh, grab, uh, well, let's grab all of these. Uh, copy paste and let's move here at the end. Sorry for, for this back and forth. Um, FE model, FE model, and uh, deflection, deflection, and also let's see this uh, in action for numbers. Oh, I think I have missed, yeah, in this case, for example, you see uh, we must define the orientation of the cross-section properly, okay? So remember that 
uh, when we uh, define the columns, we use the x uh, axis. Um, the beam, which is this one, is, is also using the x axis. But if we take the cross section and uh, orient the cross section horizontally, the beam cannot be created. Okay. Remember that the up vector by default is set to 0, 0, 1. We are changing this to 1, 0, 0. We must get rid of this if we want the beam. Okay, so now we have the upper beam uh, displayed properly. And also we must set properly the um, up vector for our, sorry, yeah, for our diagonals here. So what's the up vector for these diagonals? Well, it's the one axis perpendicular to the axis of the beam itself. So we must uh, make some uh, analysis here. Uh, so we have the S beams axis, which are these uh, two lines here. We can create a perpendicular frame. Um, we, we can do this in several ways, right? But let's just grab one and stick to that one, okay? So first thing that came to my mind was the perpendicular frame. I'm going to create this. Uh, and I'm going to reparameterize this curve. And I'm going to take a natural slider. So we have the perpendicular frames to our uh, cross section. And actually, I think it's almost irrelevant which axis we use. I think the x axis is a good option, you see, because it's pointing in, in this direction. Uh, but maybe the y axis is even better because the, the, the y-axis is probably, hmm, no, I think it's, uh, well, let's see, let's see. Uh, first of all, we have the frame, so we must um, uh, deconstruct, uh, let's see if, um, well, let's grab the component, I don't remember the name, it's deconstruct plane. So now we have access to, to the frames, uh, to the axis, sorry, uh, and so we, uh, must give this up vector this axis here. So if we get rid of this, uh, this is now going to use, as the up vector is going to use the Z vector, which is not correct uh, uh, at the moment. So we must take uh, these axis here now are two axes because it's one for the first beam and one for the second beam. So if we want to take this, Remember, always you must graph them, okay? So before plugging them into the up vector. So see what I was telling you before? Uh, if we take the x axis, we have this orientation. If we grab the y axis, we have this other orientation. So the y axis, as I was thinking, is, is best because it's not changing the orientation. But it depends on you want, how you want to assemble this, uh, this thing, actually. Uh, we could also uh, include this as a parameter during the optimization uh, process. So if we find a way, for example, to uh, include the orientation of the beam, of the cross-section, um, in the optimization process, um, this would be a parameter for the optimization phase. And so uh, we could also come up with the, the best orientation in terms of, of structural performance for our uh, system. Okay, I'm not going to implement this because it needs some um, streams and so on, so it's going to be somehow boring also for you, but it's something that, that we can implement uh, quite easily. Um, let me also uh, turn off the preview of these things here. So, uh, yeah, basically uh, that's it. We can also take a look at how the structure behaves. Oh, you see that that we uh, we still need to fix something because uh, these things are not connected. Uh, this system is not connected. So uh, basically, in this case, what we must do uh, is break things, um, split things, actually. Um, so yeah, I need to to tweak the structure a little more, um, and we can also use this uh, 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 this uh, this same. Um, um, part of the definition in order to uh, create this uh, uh, splitting of the structure. Um, we, for example, what we can do uh, is, uh, let's go back to uh, MiniP 
there should also be something here. Well, okay, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, more than enough to, to shatter this, uh, these lines. So basically we have these uh, columns here, which are two straight lines, and I want to split them at these points, okay, in order to create a three-way joint in this area, which is something that uh, happens uh, I mean, in real life. And also in this part, you will have a joint, another joint here, another joint here, exactly like we have here, right? Um, and define this joint properly like a support like we did before. Okay, so the support definition doesn't change. We only uh, must shatter this thing uh, with correspondence to the joint that we have created. So we can take a shatter component and the curve that we want to shatter are these uh, curves here. Um, also reparameterize this because, um, but I want to, uh, to shatter the first curve with this parameter and the second curve with this parameter here. So um, if, if you want to do this, if I now plug this and this, let's take a look at the result because uh, it, it depends on, uh, there are some components in Grasshopper that work differently uh, as the data manipulation theory would suggest. But anyway, we are uh, shattering two curves with two uh, parameters and we are getting uh, three segments per curve. Now, this is, uh, this is actually not correct, right? Um, we should get two segments for the first line and two segments for the second line. Do you agree? So the problem in this case is that um, each curve is being split using both parameters. So if, for example, I dispatch the result here and take a look at the, the segments, uh, if I take a curve component, take a look at these segments, you see that there are two identical segments here at the bottom, one identical segment here, which is now in list B, and two identical segments here at the top. This means that these parameters here are being used to split the, the first column here and here, and the second column here and here. But no, I want the first column to be split using only this one at this height and create this segment and this other segment, and this parameter to affect the second column, splitting it, it into two elements at this height. So if you want to do this, the only thing that you can do is play with graphs uh, in order to make the first curve being split with this parameter and the second one with this one. So if we graph the curves and we graph the parameters, now we have the first part of the first column is this one, the first part of the second column is this, is this one, and therefore we have the proper splitting occurring here. Two segments for the first column and two segments for the second column. Okay, so here they are. So these lines are going to be our columns, no longer the, the first lines. Okay, so if we do this, um, if, we, if, if we consider this uh, to be like our um, the vertical elements, we, can, we must also change things in this area. Okay? We, we, I think we can no longer use uh, the same gene pool to affect uh, the columns, uh, S-beams, and, and uh, eventually uh, the beams themselves, like we were already uh, avoiding, uh, because we have a different amount of elements right now uh, from the vertical, diagonal, and, and horizontal uh, part of the structure. So in this case, I'm going to take these uh, four things here, I'm going to flatten them because I don't need them to be in a, a data tree structure. So I have four elements that define the columns. Um, if you want, you can also um, do uh, this. Instead of uh, um, flattening this, if you want this column to have a constant thickness, and I think this is something, or sorry, a constant uh, cross section, which is something that probably is uh, highly recommended, if you think about it. Um, if you want this to happen, um, eventually you, you cannot flatten this thing here because in this data tree, these line segments are grouped by column, okay? So eventually I would use an explode uh, tree and send one couple 
to uh, this uh, uh, output here, which represents the first column, and the other one represents the second column. And I would use eventually um, this uh, in order to define, for instead of, of working with columns, I will have first column and second column. Okay, it's the only way we have to um, like um, give uh, a, a unique thickness or unique uh, cross section to the whole column. Okay, so in this case, if we want to tweak this definition, uh, we must uh, uh, change this and have this like uh, column left, for example. Uh, which is going to be also, uh, let's move this uh, right at the top. Yeah. And also this support, let's bring it down to here. So this is going to be column left. And the same way we will have, uh, well, let's tweak the column left because actually column left is uh, made up of two segments, but they are uh, aligned like this. So there is no point in having, uh, let's say, um, but in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, these points, these points, and then uh, we are defining the two different uh, the frame elements, and they have uh, two different cross sections, because if I change this, I will have two different cross sections, one with uh, height uh, with width and height of uh, 30 uh, by 30 and the other one 35 by 35 this cannot happen okay so i cannot i can no longer use a couple of uh, genes i need to use uh, uh, this the range was uh, between uh, 0 10 0 5 so i need a simple slider like this Because this way, I am defining one single cross section for both uh, chunks of this column. Okay, so like this, and uh, even if this is grafted, uh, this is grafted because we also have thickness. We only need one thickness, so this was um, 0, 0, 002 to 0, 0, 005. So let's make this uh, simpler. Let's get rid of this. Let's plug it to, to T1 and T2, and you will see that now we will only have, even if it is grafted, we will have just one cross section, which is valid for both uh, the chunks of these columns. Okay, and we must do this also for uh, the the other segment because um, the other column. Sorry, so we must take this and copy paste it, move it like here, name this column right, right, this, and use the second output of this explode tree. So it's, it's not that complex, really, but um, yes, you must pay attention to this, uh, to these details. So uh, this is the column left, this is the column right, so everything should be set properly right now. Um, as regards the uh, the beam, is the same thing. Uh, but le let's let's move like uh, one step at a time. We have the, the, the supports now. These are the rotational supports, and uh, we can no longer use the start point and end point that we have here because they don't they don't correspond to uh, the lower and upper. We also have these um, intermediate points here. So I would suggest in this case we refer to the to the whole lines. So our supports um, are going to be, well, yeah, I, I think it's uh, better also to extrapolate the endpoints for our columns. So we only have this point at the base and this point, this point at the top of each, of each column. Um, so these are the uh, rotational supports. So the endpoints are rotational supports. And we plug them here. And the only um, fixed support are exactly the start point of our column. Okay, so let's simplify also this, uh, uh, this step here. Now, we miss the uh, remaining uh, rotational uh, supports, which are this point here, this point here, and uh, um, this one, and this one. So basically, these four points 
uh, are coming out from these uh, evaluate curves. And so all of them must go inside the rotational support as well, like this. Yes, exactly. Um, and let's go to the S beams. Well, actually, the S beams uh, remain uh, as they are because they just connect to other elements, but they are formed by one single segment. So we can go to the beam. And the beam must be shattered into three segments in this case. Uh, so as we did here with this uh, shattered component, uh, we must take we must take uh, the beam, reparameterize it. There is no need here to graft anything because there is just one single beam. And also there is no need to graft the, the parameter, therefore. And the parameters that we are going to use now are the parameters that are determining this point and this point. So it's going to be this parameter here and it's going to be this parameter here. Yeah, right. So um, we have three lines. In this case, there is no data tree because uh, we are only splitting one single line. So there is a list of three segments. And these three segments are going to become our um, uh, beam chunks, like this. And in this case, for example, um, we are taking three lines, we are calculating the start and end point, we are connecting them once again all together in order to have uh, three uh, elements. Um, these three elements will share the same cross section, so it's correct to have one slider per parameter. Oh, also, uh, this is going to be plugged also in T1, of course. And uh, the load is, uh, is correct. These are grafted, so you should have here three uh, beams, exactly, they behave exactly the same. So, if everything is uh, correct, uh, which is uh, not actually, uh, we miss one column. Uh, I don't know why we miss one column, it's easy to get lost here. Oh, yeah, this is not connected. Sorry, I didn't connect the copy. So, yeah, here it is, uh, our second column. Um, so, this is pretty it. It should work, actually. Let's see what happens if I try to deform this uh, structure. Yep, it works. Now, um, this is what I wanted to get. Now, if we have this situation, um, it's interesting to optimize not only the width, height, thickness of the elements. It's only important to find what are the best connection points between the diagonals and the vertical and horizontal elements in order to make this structure more efficient, right? So these are going to be parameters for our uh, simulation. And the criteria is going to be, well, basically, the weight is less relevant in this case. Probably the maximum deflection is more relevant. I want to minimize this, uh, this uh, thing here. So let's say that um, we, uh, if we want to work with one single parameter, it can be interesting also to um, try and, and, uh, and uh, take the good old uh, Galapagos and see if uh, it already produces some interesting result. Okay. So, as regards the genome, the genome is going to be this slider. You see also that it, they work all the same. Right? So, this is going to be these four sliders, which are going to change dynamically. And, let's see, we also have the width and height of the column left, the, the thickness of the column left, we also have the width and height of the column right, the thickness of, of uh, column right. Yeah, that's it. And then we have uh, the S beams, which are this uh, gene pool here and this gene pool here. 
and also we have width height width sorry height and thickness for the upper beam so all of these are parameters for our simulation what we want to optimize in this case as fitness is the maximum deflection like this so galapagos is uh, is absolutely uh, the same in this case we only have to optimize one parameter so let's double click on this i want to minimize in this case the uh, maximum deflection so i go here in solver i want to display all genomes results actually and so we can simply yeah, start the solver And this keeps on running, 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 and eventually it will come up with some uh, relevant solution. Uh, normally, if uh, you have defined things properly and if the problem has uh, a, a consistent solution, you should see this red curve here tending to the top of this uh, graph area. Okay. Uh, if you see that these curves start to bounce up and down, up and down, up and down, it means two things. Either the system has uh, several equivalent solutions or you have not defined the problem uh, conditions uh, in, in the correct way. Okay? But if you see that this tends to an upper limit and the system is actually moving around, vibrating around uh, one equilibrium uh, configuration, then it means that the problem is defined properly and the, the solver is, is finding the, the, the best solution possible. So you see that there is some vibration still, but we already have this uh, value here. This is important. When you see that this value doesn't change anymore, it means that the system tries always tries to find another solution. But if you see that this value here is not changing for, well, uh, let's say, 10, 20 seconds, then it's more, more likely that the, the, the solver is not going to find any uh, better solution than this one. So you can stop the solver, take this, and reinstate this uh, in your simulation, and you already have the set of uh, parameter uh, in, your, uh, in your system. So this is the more efficient way of creating this structure for Galapagos. Uh, the same way, uh, they can coexist. Um, Galapagos get reset each time you close its, uh, its interface. So if you go here, you will have nothing stored inside Galapagos. So each time you run it again, it will start from scratch. Okay? Uh, it, it's different from, from gold, Goldfish. But if you take Goldfish and, uh, well, we have to redefine the parameters. And with this, uh, we will end for today. So. Um, I'm going to plug this and I'm going to plug oops, this and I'm going to plug this and this and then once again with height and thickness so you can see and then with height and thickness for the column right and uh, oh, the S beam is disconnected. Yeah, so this is an error. It was maintaining this uh, A like constant. But it's an error, but in the end, uh, it, it was just considering this as a constant uh, with uh, beams. So in the end, it, it was uh, um, not considering one variable, but the problem still had uh, a, a perfectly, uh, uh, let's say, determined solution. Uh, so width and height and thickness for uh, the upper beam. <clears throat> I think I, I think it's uh, pretty it for the parameters. Yes, and now the advantage here is that with goldfish we, we can also use one single objective, of course, but I, I think the interesting part of Goldfish or Opossum is that you can work with a multi-objective. So I would recommend that you, well, uh, use this feature, of course. Um, so 
let's run this. Let's see if we find uh, some uh, different solution. Now that we are considering also the, the weight, we want a lightweight or, well, the lighter possible uh, solution for our structure. So uh, let's, um, uh, let's leave everything like this and uh, reset all star. Uh, so eventually in this case, um, in order to optimize also the, the weight, we could come up with a different solution. Uh, let's see if we can uh, expand this a little because I also want to see the history. Uh, the distribution of, uh, of these values here is also, um, let's say, um, also adds some meaning to, uh, to, to the problem because uh, few things can happen here. Uh, you might have some cloud style distribution of points like uh, the one that we saw in the previous simulation and like the one that we are seeing here. This means that the problem is how somehow is set up properly. Um, sometimes you get some kind of hyperbola like uh, graph. In that case, uh, it means, for example, that either you are analyzing a very stupid problem in which it's evident that if you, I don't know, uh, you only have two options. You, may, you can increase, for example, the weight and that uh, decreases the deflection, and, or you decrease the weight and that increases the deflection. If you see that kind of, of uh, behavior, then solutions are uh, basically um, very simple to, to determine. Uh, if you see this cloud-like behavior, then you have more options in your uh, in your decision, in your final decision. Okay, so you see that now that we want to also optimize the weight, the solution that we are finding is uh, tending to a totally different um, uh, geometry or, or configuration. See, we already have a non-existent deflection at this point. The only thing that's happening is that the structure is becoming lighter and lighter and lighter. Of course, I suppose that this is also uh, determining that the thickness of these uh, small diagonal beams is going to be relevant in order to give the system the, the, uh, the corresponded rigidity and avoid uh, uh, like uh, too much deflection. But anyway, you see that we already have uh, a interesting result. Let's pause this. Let's go and uh, take the uh, well. I don't. I don't want to take into account the uh, the deformation. Uh, probably it's more relevant to have a lighter structure. So let's see if I reinstate this. You see that we have this kind of uh, weird situation. Of course, uh, you could also tell Goldfish that if, for example, the length of this beam is different from the length of this one, then the solution is not, is not feasible. Like determining, for example, a, a C constraint for the solution. Okay, and therefore, uh, um, this kind of solution will not be taken into account in the um, in the optimization process. So this is something that uh, uh, you might want to, uh, to play with. But anyway, uh, you see that um, with a multi-objective optimization process, you get totally different results. And I think this is more uh, interesting than the uh, simple Galapagos um, optimization. Also, now that, that um, I have connected the sliders properly, uh, it, it should be interesting to uh, rerun um, Galapagos and see if it finds the same solution, which I, I, I don't think. Uh, maybe it would be slightly different, but anyway, let's leave it running and see what happens. In the meanwhile, if you have questions, um, uh, this is the right moment. Or if everything is clear, or we need to clarify something. But you already see that in this case, for example, the beams, the diagonal beams are already tending to the upper corners. While in the previous version where everything was constant as regard the width, they, uh, were, they were starting from here and connecting more or less at the beginning, beginning and end of the beam. So the solution is more or less, uh, well, it, they are in line uh, with each other. So it's somehow, uh, uh, like something that we can uh, foresee. 
of course, we are not taking into account the weight in this case. So Galapagos doesn't care about the weight in this moment. Oh, can I? Yeah. Uh, can we, uh, in this uh, definition, consider uh, uh, the change of fixing? Uh, so uh, uh, can we add uh, a fixing uh, a type of support uh, uh, as a parameter? Um, it's a tricky question. Um, let me. Well, first of all, you no, know that uh, because the uh, okay, construction uh, uh, differs uh, when it's fixed, of course, or, uh, when it's uh, on the uh, rotate support. Of course, of course, yes, I, I clearly understand. You know what the problem is? Is this one? Um, Parameters in, in goldfish or Galapagos or opossum or whatever, um, um, let's say, optimization program you want to run, parameters are changing numbers, right? But if you, um, if you see, for example, the way that supports are, are defined, um, well, let me... Oh yeah, they are just. Uh, they I are can, just. I can, yeah, I can give uh, uh, numbers to the type of support. Yes, exactly. We are defining this uh, this support by a true false value, right? But true false value is 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 like Boolean values. It's like logic. So true false it, it also means zero one, right? So um, if we take a slider, oh, sorry, I hit the right in. On, on a y but anyway zero to one without decimal values of course um, mm -hmm. false corresponds to zero so if I plug this here we should notice no change in the icon which means that you can um, use zero one instead of, of true false in this case you can uh, use this uh, um, different combination the only problem is uh, is this um, if uh, if you um, you must understand what variations of support type you, you want to take into consideration. I mean, I would not take, for example, six sliders between 0 and 1 and plug them into X, Y, Z, R, R, X, R, Y, R, Z, because there are some types of support that it makes no sense uh, to, yeah, to of consider. Course. Of course. So, uh, yes, I you... Consider, I, uh, uh, I, I will, for example, consider only two types of... Exactly. Uh, Support. Exactly. Fixed and or, and in that or, case, or yeah, in that case, what I would also suggest is that you create some support case. For example, um, in this moment, we are considering, for example, uh, this uh, rotational uh, support yeah. type here and this fixed support here at the bottom, right? Um, but for example, you can, the, the reason why I told you that it's, uh, it becomes uh, intelligent to use stream uh, filters is that you can create a, a support condition in stream zero, including okay. all the support, and another support condition in stream one. So you define the distribution of support as you please, and then you switch between one and the other with a simple zero one. So you have just okay. one parameter. Okay, uh, I, I, I have uh, another question about yeah. uh, forces. Uh, yeah. Because in uh, in those cases, uh, you uh, consider only uh, gravity, mm. but uh, yeah. can we add uh, horizontal forces, for instance, wind? Of course. Of course. Where? Well, well um, uh, uh, first of all, uh, if, you, if, if you work with this kind of structure, norm uh, normally with this kind of structure, wind, it, it, doesn't give you a, a real, uh, doesn't affect the structure too much. So you might want to consider if it's the case or not to consider wind in this case. When we will switch to, for example, shell structure, in that case, yes, it, it will become uh, more important. But anyway, the way that you uh, simulate non-vertical uh, forces or loads is simply by changing the orientation of the force vector. So in this case, for example, we are considering... Like Sorry? Like X vector. X vector, Y vector, or a combination of X, Y, if you want. Okay. Yeah. So it's just like this. 
But in this case, I repeat, these are linear elements. They don't it's offer too course, much drag. So I, I wouldn't do this. But with the shell, yes, of course. We will be talking about shells as well. So, so yes, we'll, you will see this. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, and by the way, now that we have optimized things, we can also double check what happens. Uh, I mean, the, the deformation is, is uh, still exaggerated, as you, as you can see. But you see that it is not affecting the columns anymore. See, of course, if you exaggerate, the columns are, are going to bend. But uh, this is the optimized version of our previous uh, system. So at first, the columns were also bending, and they were bending badly. But now they are not bending anymore. And the beam, of course, is optimized in order to don't have a huge amount of deflection because you see that this is the uh, highest amount and is uh, reaching uh, 0 0.000048 meters. So it's basically nothing. 